very quickly, uh, I want to uh, mention that NUA is, uh, is short for the Network for Environment and Weather Applications. Uh, it's a website, but it's really a lot more than that. It's a decision support system. Uh, so really, we have a lot of fruit resources and tools on here uh, that I and um, especially my predecessor, Dr. Julie Carroll, have developed um, really since the early 90s. And uh, one of the reasons um, that the pollen tube growth model um, is on here, in my opinion, is because uh, we really are a true collaboration. What I wanna do is just zoom out a little bit to show you the full extent of our network. So what you're seeing here is, and I'm actually gonna zoom out even further because there's some exciting um, new locations out in the Western US. So Utah has now come on board. Um, but if we come back into the Eastern United States, we've got over 700 physical weather stations linked to every single tool on NUA. And so when we talk about um, providing the pollen tube growth model as a resource to all of you as growers in Eastern New York and New England, um, we really have good coverage. Um, it's, it's possible because uh, we work with uh, our neighboring states, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, all, all coming together uh, to make this resource available. So I just wanted to mention that very quickly. When we start talking specifically about the pollen tube growth model, um, you can access it one of two ways. So if you look up here, we have our standard navigation bar. If you go to crop management, um, you'll see the apple pollen tube growth uh, right here. So um, if you just click on that, it will redirect you uh, to ptgm.nua.cornell.edu. Um, we're actually in a transition phase, uh, which is why uh, the pollen tube growth model looks different from our old website. Um, that's a different story. If we have time at the end of the seminar or offline, I can uh, answer um, questions about that, but we're transitioning to a new um, web design in November. Uh, but for now, uh, if you go to this URL, this is the landing page uh, for what Greg and Julie and myself and uh, our colleagues at the Northeast Regional Climate Center who do our programming um, have released. So everything Greg has been talking about over you know, the past 45 minutes is built in here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna walk through uh, and I'm literally going to build my own personal profile using all of these neat features uh, that are available to you. Um, the only other thing I'll add is that if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. Um, and Mike and Greg, maybe you can just keep track. If there's something that's very timely as I'm doing something, definitely jump in. Otherwise, I can circle back um, once my little portion here is done. I don't want to take too much time, but I do want to show you how this works. So the first thing you want to do um, is establish uh, a block. Uh, you can think of this as like a standard management unit. So if we're talking about different apple varieties um, or, or different parts of your farm, it's really up to you. But to start the process, you're gonna click block. So that opens up this window. You can enter a block name, and I'm just gonna put in um, sample block for these purposes. And then in the next uh, drop down field is where you select your apple variety. And again, Greg already pointed out that research has been done on a core set uh, of, um, of varieties here. So I think I'll just, I'll uh, select Honeycrisp uh, for this demo. And then the next field, you select your state of interest. Uh, and for the purposes of what we're doing here, I'm gonna use a station that I know works uh, here in Geneva, New York. Um, but you'll see that there are 168 available locations across the state. If you were to change this to Massachusetts, I know we've got a few folks from Massachusetts here. This is automatically gonna update. So now you see that there are 52 locations um, available in Massachusetts and so on and so forth. But again, if we go back to New York and then simply scroll down and select Geneva, it's in alphabetical order. This is gonna get us started. So this will give you a baseline uh, to build your model from. So we're gonna hit add block. And you see that now I have a list. It's a list of one right now 
Um, but I will mention the first of our neat features is that if you have multiple blocks or management units, you can add as many as you want. The way this model works right now that we're looking at is it stores it in your local browser cache. So any information you add is gonna be stored as long as you don't clear that information out. Um, this is kind of a compromise until the new website launches where we're gonna have profile systems and saved settings so that you don't even ever have to worry about uh, cached data anymore. But for now, that's how it works. And so um, this basic block here, you'll simply see a list of two, three, four different um, management units. So to get the model started, uh, once you create your sample block here, you wanna select a start date. And we can go back in time to do this. And what I'd like to do is go back to 2019 and I will start at May 5th, just like Greg was talking about in his screenshots. So you can navigate through this calendar, which is available again by clicking start date. And I believe it was maybe May 5th, which I wrote down. And then um, you can also select time uh, because uh, this model is very time sensitive. So if you do that, you're gonna see um, available hours within the single day of May 5th. This is a 24 hour um, selection. So 1800 hours is gonna be uh, 6 p.m. I believe. So select that and then this should populate. And there we go. So now we have a model start date. Um, the next step is where we start to enter our data for style length. And this is where we get to the second um, really neat feature. Um, you have two options for inserting your style length. You can insert an average style length, or like Greg said, if you're out in the field or um, you wanna be very precise, uh, you can have the model do a calculation. So I actually wanna do this uh, to show you the full features. So we're gonna collect um, a series of style links. And again, this is just for demo. I am not a horticulturist, uh, but I'm just gonna put in a couple of sample links. Maybe we'll start with uh, nine millimeters. And I'll, I should say it's always millimeters, it's not inches or centimeters. Uh, so that's important to know. If you put in, if you, uh, put in uh, anything other than that, it will update. Okay, so we have our first measurement. I'll just put in three measurements. So let's say nine millimeters was your first length. Let's put in uh, 8.5. So you're gonna do that. It's doing that. And what it's doing is it's taking an average of all the different lengths. So let's do one more um, just for kicks here. And it'll take just a second. So now I've got three style lengths. Uh, and so the average is 8.5. So I'm gonna close out of this. And so now the model has started. Um, what you're seeing here uh, is a time frame of May 5th all the way to December 31st. And I think what we wanna do for this um, time period is really narrow that down because you're interested in uh, thinning those blooms really in this early part of May. Um, what I will point out is that you can drag your cursor anywhere along this accumulation curve and it's going to show you a number of things. Let me just uh, adjust this a little bit um, so that you can uh, see some of these things uh, that are customizable. Uh, what I really want to do is I want to adjust that end date so right now it's set to December 31st. Um, to get to this interface, I'm clicking on this little pencil icon. So when I hover over it, it says edit block. This is where everything else goes into the model. So I'm just gonna go down here and we're gonna go back to May 2019, uh, April. And I think we'll just uh, work, um, I'll choose May 20th for now. So when you click that and hit update block, it's gonna give you a much more manageable time frame. 
Uh, even that maybe is a little bit um, beyond the scope of what we want to do. So let me adjust it once more. But you can see how flexible this is. If something doesn't fit my needs, I'm able to adjust it right away and everything is being saved. And that looks a lot better. So now we can uh, revisit what Greg was telling us about targeting that date of uh, first spray to get to 110%. So emergence, 110% is happening May 9th at 2300 hours. So let's that, keep that in our mind. Down here, we have a button um, that will change. Uh, so I'm gonna enter the first spray, but after I do that, it's then gonna say set second spray, but let's go ahead and do the first one. Um, and I think we said May 18th, we'll select 2300 hours. And that was not it, I'm sorry. So uh, I was looking at May 9th. So again, Let me back up here. So this is a great example of why we have a customizable model. So if I go into edit block, I've already entered my first spray and you could see, well, I can't go back to change that if I want to. If you open up your edit function by clicking on this pencil icon, you can change your first spray. So if you go in here and we go back to May 9th, 2300 hours, and update the block. There it is. So there's our first spray. Uh, and according to um, what Greg is chatting with us about, you know, we did a pretty good job of targeting that 110% uh, uh, growth point. Which hey, Dan, I'm gonna interrupt here just real quickly and just mention that. So, you know, what Dan's showing us now is the model using 2019 weather data. So it's a little bit, um, you know, all the weather data is already there. But for 2020, when you're actually doing this in real time and you're trying to figure out when to put that application on, the really cool thing is that um, NUA pulls in weather forecast data. So you can look out, I forget what it is, Dan, I think it's five days into the future. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. so you actually you know, you'll, you'll, you know what the, the recorded temperature is up to the, you know, the current time, usually the hour before newer stations are really quick these days for updating the, the um, recorded data, but then you can project forward up to five days to figure out when you're going to get to a hundred percent of the style length. That's yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll just set a second spray in here just to get a sense of, um, what we can get from historical data, but I think there may be a couple of stations uh, that we can access in real time here uh, for, for the current year. So um, I'll just finish describing what the features are and then we can certainly look at that real time uh, feature. Um, so if we set the second spray uh, for, let's see, it was 70%, Greg, is that right? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, so we get to 70% on May 14th at 9 a.m. Let's go back to May 14th at 9 a.m. We'll get that second application there at 70%. And then you can see that achieves uh, the goal. So if we want to look at current data. I'm actually going to very quickly reset this and create another block. We'll use current data. Um, I'll just use Honeycrisp again. And then uh, maybe we'll go, Greg, do you think there are uh, areas or Mike areas in the Hudson Valley that would be at the point where they're looking at, at, at pollen tube thinning? Probably not quite yet. I think okay, uh, so Lower Hudson Valley is probably at, at pink from what I understand. Okay, um, so I'll go a little bit further south, uh, maybe Pennsylvania or New Jersey. How about, let's try New Jersey. And then um, how about, uh, we'll just see what happens with Princeton. Okay, so the start date, 
Um, we'll use March 10th, see how that works. And then we'll just enter an average style length this time in the interest of time. Click OK. All right, yeah, so um, let's say 110%. Is on May nineteenth or March nineteenth, around nineteen hundred hours. So let's do that very quickly. March nineteenth, nineteen hundred hours, and then um, I'll just enter another one here, March twenty fifth at eleven, and then I'll talk about the forecast data. So you get a sense of the flexibility that's built in here. What we're seeing over here with this uh, lighter shade area, this is the forecast information. So if we're at March 31st right now, this takes you out to April 1st uh, in this scenario, but you are getting that forecast. Um, and by coincidence, April, the, it ends at 100%. I didn't plan that. Um, so that's, that's how the model itself works. There's a couple of other uh, visualization features. We have a growth table down here. It's the same data. Uh, it just is in a tabular format. And then you can also display the growth graph underneath. And these displays sequentially. If you want to turn them off, you can turn them off um, and so on and so forth. Um, are there any questions at this point? Um, Greg, if you wanna jump in, if there's anything else I'm not covering, please uh, definitely, it's, it's really great to be on the same webinar with you because uh, we can come at this from both ends. Okay, well, if not, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If other questions do come up, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on until the webinar is over, uh, but I'm going to turn it back over to Greg. Great. Thanks, Dan. And I'll um, just also say that there is uh, both a web-based version and in um, like an iOS version of the pollen tube growth model that's available. It's not a separate app. It's just within the new website for now. I think plans are in the works, but not quite available for 2020 yet. That's a, that is a good point. Um, so the website, so what we were looking at is responsive. So we don't have a separate app, uh, but you can access it from any device and it's going to respond to the size of your screen. So if you really do want to take your smartphone out in the orchard and do uh, those measurements, you can enter them directly uh, without having to come back to the office. Um, and, and just to follow up on that, one of the key things then is to remember that um, because the data is being stored locally, either on your computer or your phone, you can't enter the data in one and see it in the other device for the time being. That will change shortly. Dan and his team are working on um, allowing all this to be a cross-platform system but it's a lot of development work on their side. So for 2020, you'll have to either enter it in twice or just use, you know, use your phone, use your computer, whichever one it is. Great, thanks.